are the subsurface oceans of Enceladus the best chance of finding life on another world? It's a good question, Stuart. Um, Enceladus um, is it's a tiny moon. Um, before we went to the Saturnian system with Cassini, um, we would have assumed that that moon was inactive geologically because it's so small. It's one of those few uh, times anyone in the UK will <laughs> recognize when you say, how big is something? And you go, it's the size of Wales. <laughs> well, it is the size of Wales, right? It's quite a small thing. Um, and uh, y yet it turned out to be active. So it seems there are pockets of liquid water below the surface. And anywhere that we find liquid water on Earth, we find life. So it is a candidate. Um, there's more water on Jupiter's moon Europa, undoubtedly, below the surface. There's more water in the oceans of Europa than in all the oceans of the Earth combined, because it's a, an ocean that completely spans the moon beneath the icy surface and is very deep. Um, so maybe Europa is a stronger candidate. There's a lot of argument about it. Um, we don't know. One of the problems with looking at moons is that we don't know how long they've been active, uh, what heated them up, when it heated them up, and how long that heat has been present. So how long has the liquid water and geological activity been present? We don't really know that with, with um, Enceladus. So if, if you, we, uh, we don't know how long from when water is present on the average, we've no idea how long it might be before you can possibly have life emerge. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very good question. Ultimately, the answer is you have to go and look. And uh, the great thing that Enceladus has is that it's potentially easier to look uh, than Europa. Although there's some sense, there's some evidence now that there may be water uh, rising up from, from the surface of Europa. But the thing about Enceladus is it's got these fountains of ice coming up from the surface, which are coming from the subsurface liquid. And so you don't have to land on it necessarily. Um, you, can, you can collect that water by orbiting, flying around. And so, so the, the fact that it's accessible may make it interesting from an exploratory perspective. Um, there's also Mars. Um, Mars, of course, is a planet, not a moon. It's in the habitable zone around the sun. It was very Earth-like, we know, at some point, let's say four billion years ago, when Earth was just beginning to settle down and about the same time that life was beginning on Earth. Uh, Mars was Earth-like. Oceans, rivers, rain, temperate climates. So, you know, it's, this is a controversial area because, uh, and the reason it's controversial, or, or let's not, the controversial might not be the right word, but the, the reason it's a, an, an interesting area is because we don't know, right? Because we don't know what conditions are really necessary for life. Um, but li I, I, if I was to absolutely force to guess, I would think that Mars is the prime candidate for the origin of life um, and maybe still subsurface today on Mars. It's certainly the easiest to visit. Um, so so let, let's, let's go with Mars, uh, but that's a guess. And there will be people watching this in the planetary science community who are screaming at the screen because there are, there are fans of Europa, there are fans of Enceladus, and there are fans of Mars. I'm a fan of all of them. I'm a fan of all three. They're all interesting because they have, there's evidence that liquid water was or still is present on those uh, objects. Why are all planets and moons round? Tabitha, that's a brilliant question. And I actually did this in a series that I made for the BBC called Forces of Nature. Um, the reason, basically, is that gravity doesn't care about the direction. Right, so gravity works the same in every direction. So it pulls things in, in the same way. And if you think about that, as long as the thing is big enough or massive enough such that gravity is strong enough to squash it, then it will squash that thing into a ball, into a sphere, because what else could it do? So th there's actually a limit, um, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but I know what the name is. It's called the potato radius. 
<laughs> and if something is below the potato radius, then it's not massive enough for, for, for gravity to be strong enough. This is for things that are made of rock and things that we could have a whole other conversation about black holes and very small, massive things. But for things like asteroids and planets and things made of rock, there's this kind of minimum size. And if you go above that size, so the gravity gets strong enough, then it will squash it into a ball because there's nothing else it could do. I mean, imagine that you have something that works the same everywhere. Uh, why would it make something a cube? Because a cube is like a thing which has got these six sides and there's no reason for it to do that. So, so gravity for things like asteroids and planets, things made of rock and gas, um, then it will tend to squash things into spheres. Professor Brian Cox, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey, live on stage, using state-of-the-art LED screen technology. Theatres and arenas will be filled with images of faraway galaxies, alien worlds, supermassive black holes, and a time before the Big Bang.